In the last lesson, number five, we heated wood in the absence of oxygen and produced charcoal sticks, goopy creosote, and smoke coming out of the vent tube. The smoke, it turns out, was also comprised of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, as was the creosote. So Lavoisier correctly assumed that wood was composed of three elements, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Those three were considered to be elements because they couldn't be broken down when heated in the absence of air all by themselves. Nothing that Lavoisier could do could break carbon down any further, nor oxygen, nor hydrogen, when heated alone in tubes without air. Thus, they were considered to be elements. By the time of his death, Lavoisier had named at least 20 elements, including some metals and phosphorus and sulfur. And the list of elements grew fairly slowly until the 1800s. By 1800, powerful batteries were produced, which could create enough electricity to break down water, as shown in Lesson 4. And it was this man, Humphrey Davy, who perfected and used this process called electrolysis to discover potassium and sodium. He first discovered potassium by applying electrodes to moistened potash, which came from wood ash. And he also applied the same technique to moistened lye to produce sodium. Later on, he was able to melt table salt when he increased the temperature of the salt to over 800 degrees. And when he applied electrodes to the melted salt, he discovered that it was also made of sodium. But furthermore, besides sodium on the negative electrode, a yellow gas bubbled up on the positive electrode. Here is an illustration of the industrial process used to make sodium and chlorine commercially. On the negative electrode on the left, sodium metal deposits and is kept in a vacuum so it won't corrode and on the middle electrode, the positive electrode, yellow bubbles of chlorine gas are produced. So here's a sample of sodium from our lab, which doesn't look much like metal, but that's because it's corrosive. It's so reactive that it oxidizes on contact with air. Watch. As I cut through this, you'll see that indeed the inside is a shiny metal, but the luster disappears almost instantly because sodium becomes oxidized on contact with air. Cutting through more layers, you can see that the oxide layer doesn't penetrate too deep because the shiny luster is still there, but it will eventually all disappear. To show you how reactive sodium is, we'll throw some in water here and show you that it actually reacts with water and becomes what we call sodium hydroxide. Now, just to show you exactly how reactive sodium is, I'm going to take a piece as big as we started out with here and throw it in a bucket of water outside. Watch what happens when I throw a piece of sodium in water with a weight so it sinks to the bottom of the pail. I'm going to take the sodium, get a knife so it'll sink to the bottom, and we'll see if it sizzles like it did in the studio. Here we go, Rich. I'd say that that was pretty sizzling, wouldn't you, Richie? Yeah. Wouldn't you? <laughs> you get a little smoke over there? You should see the smoke in the trees. That's sodium, man, very reactive. Now, besides sodium, Davies also isolated another very similar metal called potassium. Here we see a piece of potassium. When we cut through potassium, we see that it's even softer than sodium, and it's also more reactive. It's shiny at first on the inside, but within seconds, it turns into an oxide and becomes gray. Look at that. And also, when you throw it in water, the potassium does react like sodium, but even more violently. Watch this. Taking a piece of potassium and throwing it in water, it catches on fire. So it's significantly more reactive than sodium. And a third metal called lithium, which wasn't isolated until 1817 by a man named Berzelius, was also discovered to be similar to both sodium and potassium. It's soft, but not as soft as potassium or sodium, and it also reacts with water. Although it does take longer to completely react than either sodium or potassium. So when we compare the three metals, we find that they all float in water, and lithium is softer than most metals, but Sodium is much softer, and potassium is even softer. 
And when we compare reactivities, we see that lithium is very reactive in water, but sodium is more reactive, and potassium is even more reactive. Two other metals extracted from wood ash include magnesium, seen here, and calcium, both very reactive, but not as reactive as the three we just saw, and also not as soft. We'll talk more about these later. Now, by the mid-1800s, over 60 elements have been isolated by chemists. And among those elements, the most curious were a group of colored gases that acted very similarly to the yellow chlorine that Davy isolated when he produced sodium from salt. Those gases include fluorine, which is also a yellowish-green gas, Bromine, which is a liquid at room temperature, but easily evaporates into a gas. It's brown. And the most curious of all is a solid called iodine. Now, iodine is a solid at room temperature, but with very little heating, it can be turned into a beautiful purple gas through sublimation. Sublimation is the process of evaporating from a solid to a gas without going through the liquid stage. Here I'm placing some iodine into an Erlenmeyer flask and heating it. And as you can see, within a matter of seconds, the iodine begins to turn into a beautiful purple gas. I'm temporarily placing a stopper on the Erlenmeyer flask so the buildup of gas can be more obvious. The gas swirls around from convection. And as the flask is cooled, the iodine condenses and forms crystals on the side of the glass, as can be seen here. When heating is continued without the stopper, all of the iodine eventually sublimes, leaving nothing in the Erlenmeyer flask. So you can see that even though iodine is a solid at room temperature, with just a small amount of heating, it turns into a colored gas which has the same properties or similar properties to the yellow chlorine, fluorine, and brown bromine that we showed you earlier. Now, while Davies was busy discovering these new elements outlined in this video, this man, John Dalton, came up with a theory about what was going on at the microscopic level when elements such as sodium and chlorine come together to form salt. And we will describe Dalton's theory in detail in the next lesson.